So I see we've got Jim here. And yeah, I'm here, Allison. So let me know when you're ready and I'll start her up. I think, yeah, we're good to go. You can go ahead and kick it off. Um, uh, or I guess a quick introduction. Uh, we've partnered with TAAA here before. I'll let Jim do the more in-depth explanation of who they are, but you might have seen them around town uh, at several different uh, schools, events, outreach, Space Fest every summer when we have that in Tucson, and they are well-versed in astronomical knowledge, operating telescopes, binoculars, star charts, you name it. Um, these are the hands-on Tucson um, education professionals. So you probably have seen them around if you haven't. Uh, this might be your first introduction, but yes, welcome to AAA. Jim, I'll let you, um, I'll let you take it away. All right, well, thanks, Allison. Uh, yeah, we're actually kind of going a little stir crazy, you know, since we shut everything off uh, in mid-March for COVID. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, my astronomers that are itching to do uh, some star parties. So we have, we did kind of do a transition um, into the virtual realm and that's been a lot of fun and we've actually been able to reach out to you know people all over the world just like we're doing tonight probably you know so that's really cool to be able to expand our audience even more than than we would if we were just doing the Tucson uh, star parties but we're hoping uh, after the first of the year we can get back into doing some in-person ones but we are going to try to continue the quarterly uh, virtual star parties similar to what we're going to kind of do tonight. So as Allison mentioned, I'm Jim Knoll. Um, I belong to the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. Uh, we're the local astronomy club here in Tucson. Uh, we have about 400 members, and uh, so we're a pretty good sized club. Uh, last year in 2019, we did 225 outreach events. So that was events for um, schools, youth groups, the public, nonprofits, even some of the local resorts. So it, we, uh, I have about 60 active volunteers that help help out with a variety of of the uh, events. And we have three other ones, three uh, volunteers on tonight, and I'll introduce them in just a minute. Um, but yeah, so in fact, I'll go ahead and do that now. So tonight we're gonna be looking at, uh, through the telescopes of Rick Paul, Jim O'Connor, and Bernie Stinger. We're all located here in Tucson. Um, and so sometimes we actually do have some of our uh, our folks uh, geographically separated, which is kind of the cool thing being able to uh, to do so. Uh, we do have some clouds floating around, so we may not be able to get in everything, um, but we did do a, a similar kind of star party focusing on the solar system objects a couple of weeks ago. So I've got that recording queued up. So if we can't get into something live, then uh, we'll, what we'll end up doing is doing it uh, off the recording, but hopefully we can at least get started with some of the stuff live. Um, so yeah, um, right now I think we've got partial uh, clearing out there. All right, so what we're gonna start with is we are actually gonna start with the moon. We were gonna wrap up with the moon, but the moon's uh, in some clearing right now. And so we're gonna, we're gonna do that. Um, I'm going to share my screen here real quick and I'm gonna switch over to the moon. We'll get that going. So, you know, when you look at the moon, and hopefully you can see this all right, you can see quite a few dark areas. Those are the Marias, or what they thought of a long time ago as actually they thought they were the seafloor, the seas. And so Maria means seas. So we have uh, right here outlining the lunar poodle. This is the, um, the head of the poodle, the body of the poodle, the legs coming down here, and the little fluff ball tail back here. So that's um, five of the mare and several lunar landings that took place there. And then we've got the sea of showers over here, the ocean of storms, uh, sea of moisture, sea of clouds. And then we've got a couple or three fairly significant craters that are normally able to see, uh, Copernicus, Kepler, and Tycho. Now the first quarter moon, which is what we're viewing, we're just a little bit past first quarter. So we're actually seeing from probably right about here kind of down this direction. So we won't see any of this stuff on the left, but we should have a pretty good view here. Um, also, uh, just as a kind of a refresher here, you can see where uh, the Apollo sites, uh, where the Apollo um, landings were. And two of them are in the uh, lunar poodle. Apollo 11 is down here and where his belly button would be. 
and Apollo 17 is up here in his neck. Um, 15 is kind of over here, uh, 12 and 14 are down in this area, and then here's the, the big um, craters that we've seen before. All right, so what we're going to do before I switch it over to, oh, let me show, let me show you the back side. So here's here's the front side. We just look at the back side of the moon is totally different, uh, as you can see in this picture. Uh, now the moon, when it orbits the Earth, it it's called what's called tidally locked. So it it rotates at the exact same speed that it orbits around the Earth. So all we ever see is this uh, the front side or the visible side. But the back side is totally different. There's not much for seas. There's a lot of craters you can see in there. Um, so it's it's totally different. We uh, The Chinese did just land a uh, lander and rover on the back side. Uh, the tricky part with doing any missions on the back side of the moon is that uh, you have to have a separate spacecraft that can orbit up high and be able to have visual sight with the Earth as a communications relay. And so that's why it's important because if you're on the ground, on the surface, on the backside, you won't be able to get line of sight going there. So uh, that's uh, that's important to have. So there'll probably be more missions to the to the far side of the of the moon, but most everything um, is going to be focusing on the near side. And you know, down in the polar regions is where they they know there's a fair amount of water. But I think NASA is going to make an announcement Monday about um, possibly discovered some areas along the equator that might be interesting for uh, landings as well. So I think they're going to, they may adjust where they're going to send the uh, Artemis capsule and the, and the first U.S. landings anyway. All right, before I turn it over to Rick, I'm just going to show you Rick's uh, scope here. And Rick, if you want to go ahead and talk about your setup, and then I will stop the share and you can uh, share your picture of the moon. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Rick Paul. What you're looking at here is my telescope in my backyard. This is a four inch refractor telescope. A refractor telescope is of the design that it's all lenses, uh, no mirrors. So the light is coming in one end and going down to the other end. Now at the other end, beyond the focuser, you see a black tube there, then a tall uh, black thing sticking up and a red thing sticking out the back. Well. The tall thing is a filter wheel to put different filters in front of the camera. And the final thing there is my astro camera. And then the mount here that, the, that everything's attached to. So this is exactly what you're looking at right now. It's just in the dark. So this is what you're going to be looking through this exact setup. All right, I'll go ahead and stop the share. You can share yours. And let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, what, you're, what you're seeing. Yeah, so what I've got up right now is I've got the moon. And you can see, that, and this is live, the camera is shooting uh, many, many frames a second of this live. Um, you'll actually be able to see, because because of the clouds, I was not able to accurately align my scope. So the moon is creeping a little bit on us. You'll see it creeping up a little bit. But here you'll see the, the poodle. There's the head, there's the body, there's the front legs, there's the back legs. There's the, there's the tail. Um, the Apollo 11 landing site was right there. Um, now, one common question we always get is, can our telescopes see the Apollo 11 landing site? And the answer is no. Uh, not even um, the most powerful um, professional telescopes can resolve enough down to see the equipment left on the moon. However, we recently did get some images of the equipment left on the moon due to a satellite that was orbiting the moon called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It was close enough in its orbit around the moon and had powerful enough cameras, it was able to see the equipment out there. So if you go out to the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter website, um, you can find those, those images and you can see kind of some of the stuff left behind. So right now the moon um, is just moving past um, it's um, what's called the waxing gibbous, gibbous phase. It's moving towards a full moon. And spookily enough, the full moon this year occurs on Halloween. So how's that for timing? Uh, Jim, is there anything else you wanted to point out about the moon here? 
Um, no, I think that was uh, that's good. Just keep the share going for right now. Um, you can see well, we when we look at uh, images of the moon or when you look at it visually through a uh, telescope, you want to kind of focus on the terminator, right where day goes into night. And so there, that is where you can really see some nice depth to the craters. And, uh, and you know, it's almost getting uh, to the point that it's getting too bright and too big for some areas. You can see on the right uh, to the left of the face of the, the pool, you can see some a mountain range. And so, and you can see the, the height and the depth of the craters and the height of the mountains um, a lot easier when you're looking right along the Terminator. Because um, wh what happens is that, you know, if you look at the moon when it's full, then it's like taking a picture at um, high noon and everything's kind of flat. So it's good to be able to, uh, to do it uh, when it's like a you know first quarter or a nice crescent moon or even a last quarter in the early morning stages. Uh, now the way the theory is of how the moon formed was uh, when the earth was very young, probably only uh, maybe a couple hundred million years old. So it was still mostly molten. We ended up having an impact by a large Mars-sized planet called Theia. And when it impacted the molten Earth, most of Theia was incorporated into the Earth, but some of the Earth as well as parts of Theia were blown up into space. And so for a short little while, we had rings going around the, uh, the moon. And then eventually the material that was up into space they think into two little moonlets who then originally a single um, moon. And so that's, uh, that's how the moon was, was formed. And when it first formed, it was only about 15,000 miles away. Right now, it ranges between 225,000 and 250,000. So it's, uh, it's important to um, you know, we realize that back then when it was young and when it was only 15,000 miles away, the moon would have had a significant uh, gravitational impact on the earth. And it would have, uh, we would have caused probably miles, several mile high um, tidal waves washing up into land once the earth started to solidify. So the moon slowly drifting, drifting further away from the uh, earth. It's, it's fortunate right now that it's at the perfect distance and it's the perfect size that uh, we can have total solar eclipses because it's just the right size away from us to completely cover the sun, even though it's considerably smaller. Eventually, the moon will probably drift far enough away that we won't be able to have total solar eclipses. We'll have at more annular eclipses where there's a little ring going around it. All right, so that's the moon. Um, Jim, if you want to jump in on anything, you can, or Bernie. Yeah, Jim, I'd like to just bring up uh, one little point up near the top of the screen. It's actually rolling off the screen a little bit. It, between the head of the poodle, there it goes, the sea, between the Sea of Serenity and um, the Sea of Showers next to it is the tallest area on the uh, side of the moon that faces us. Right there, that's the Apennines or Montes Apenninus um, as a range. And, and uh, down just short of the, just below the gap in that range is the highest point on this side, about 8,000 kilometers. And it's uh, Mount, ha Mount uh, um, my mind is gone, Mount Huygens. Anyway, uh, and on the opposite side of that gap, the, the upper part of that gap is is where the Apollo 17 landed, uh, or Apollo 15 landed, and it actually landed on the side of a hill. I accidentally, there was an error in their software. And so they didn't land on the flat Maria like they thought they were going to, they were actually tipped at an angle. It turned out to be a good thing because the first night they were on the moon, some, some liquid bags broke open. And there was a lot of liquid in the, in the lander but it all poured or it all rolled to a place that wouldn't damage the uh, lander. If it had been landed flat, it was 
probable that it would not have been able to take off because of damage from the liquid. And uh, the other interesting thing is when they got out of the uh, Apollo 15, they were able to do a lot more science than they planned because they were on the side of the hill and they could get the, the data that they could gather was, um, it, it was, it was pretty beneficial for them that they landed another few degrees. They might've gone over on their side, but they ended up uh, salvaging a great mission. Very cool. All right. So um, Rick, go ahead and stop your sharing. And then I'm going to share my screen here in a minute. Let's see. For some reason, I am not seeing the one I wanted to share. So um, what I was going to show you, and we'll come back to it, and I'll see if I can get it to come up later. I was going to show you the current position of the uh, of the planets, but uh, that desktop is not showing up. Let me try it one more time. There we go. Now it's showing up. OK. So this is the current position of the planets around the sun. Um, if you remember. Uh, Probably, let's see, it was, I think October 13th, Mars was in opposition. And what that means, and you maybe saw some of this when uh, Flandreau was going, but what that means is that Mars was opposite of the sun from Earth. So the Earth would have been right, you know, would have been back in about here, back a little bit uh, in between Mars and the sun. We have now sped on by Mars because we're in a faster orbit. Um, Mercury and Venus, will, they'll speed on around and come back and catch us here pretty soon. But so that's, uh, that's the current position of the, uh, of the, of the uh, um, inner planets. And then if you go out, we're, we're going to do, uh, there's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and then little old Pluto. Um, and I'm just going to show you real quick why Pluto is a little bit different. If you look, you can see that it has a significant different angle to the uh, orbit than the uh, other, uh, the, inner, the regular planets. So they think that's why it's kind of a Kuiper belt object. Um, I think we're about to lose Mars. So we were going to go Jupiter next, but uh, Bernie, are you uh, able to do Mars? Yeah, it might be a good time, Jim. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop it. So Mars is our next door neighbor. You can go ahead and share your screen whenever you're ready. Um, Mars is our next door neighbor further out from, uh, um, from us. So it's the next door neighbor going out. And so what uh, it's, it's probably the most visited planet because that's so accessible. It's about half the size of the Earth. So uh, it's, it's much smaller than the Earth. Um, and it's kind of primarily made up of uh, iron oxide. Um, so that's why it looks uh, red. It's kind of a rusty, rusty uh, looking color. Uh, the, it, Mars has two, two moons, Deimos or Deimos and, uh, and uh, see, I'm drawing a blank on the other, Phobos are the two moons that it's got. Uh, we got lots of rovers and landers on there and things like that. So uh, I think, uh, you know, there's there's definitely plans to go back to Mars or with or to Mars with humans, but probably after we do the uh, the uh, moon first. All right. Um, so go ahead and share your screen, Bernie, if you're ready. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I think I've got it now. Uh, hi, I'm Bernie Stinger. I'm a member of uh, the Tucson uh, Astronomical Society as well as the Minnesota Astronomical Society. And um, uh, you can probably guess uh, where I am in any particular uh, uh, season. Uh, so right now I'm looking at Mars uh, through my telescope and I'd like to show you my scope real quick. So here is a picture of my telescope right now uh, that's set up. Uh, this was taken about an hour ago. Uh, before the sunset, 
and uh, you can see uh, uh, this is a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope with a dew shield on the front. Uh, and in the back end here, I'm running a Mellencam uh, video camera. And that information is along with a lot of the control capability is all being fed through a router and back in this direction where I'm sitting right now. Uh, so let me, um, let me show you my screen before I lose Mars altogether. Unfortunately, we have cloud cover here that seems to be coming and going. Uh, so we're trying to squeeze things in uh, as the cloud cover kind of moves around. Um, so you should be able to see uh, my scope screen right now. And uh, this is Mars. And I'll blow it up a little bit. Uh, this is through a little bit of a hazy cloud cover. Uh, so it's not as bright and as clear as I would have liked it. Uh, but you can make out a few things uh, on the uh, uh, on the planet itself. Uh, first of all, uh, you can see on the bottom here, it's just visible every now and then you can kind of pick it out. It's kind of a white patch. Uh, just to the right of the bottom. And that's the polar cap. Uh, so it kind of comes and goes. You know, when they first started looking at Mars with high powered telescopes, they weren't sure uh, what exactly these features were. And it wasn't until we had uh, Mariner 4 go by there uh, back in the uh, uh, mid 60s, I believe, uh, that took pictures and finally proved that Mars was a dead planet. But up until then, they weren't sure what these features were that they were looking at. And you can kind of get an idea of why, uh, because they're blurry. They Sometimes you can see them more clearly than others. You can see the image kind of uh, jumps around a little bit. That's from uh, the atmosphere uh, causing dispersion uh, of the light. Um, so it was very difficult to figure out what we were looking at uh, with high powered telescopes uh, years and years ago. Uh, but to give you an idea of what's, what we've got here on the bottom again was the polar cap. Uh, up on the top, uh, this lighter area is called Arcadia. And just below it uh, is the Tharsis region. Uh, to the right of that is uh, the what's called the Amazonas region. Now, in the lower section here, uh, there's some darker areas. These are Maria, what they called Maria at the time. And like Maria on the moon, uh, they thought that Maria were oceans, or at least that was the supposition. Uh, actually, uh, on the moon, Maria are uh, uh, frozen, or not frozen, but uh, solidified uh, lava flows. However, on Mars, the maria are actually big deserts. Uh, so this is one of them here. There's another one over here. Uh, this is Maria Serenum. And the one on the right, I believe, is Maria Erthenaeum. Um, and there's a patch on the bottom here. I haven't quite been able to identify that. Yet I've been looking uh, on the maps. I'm not terribly sure about that one, but uh, these are two of the the uh, the more obvious uh, Maria, which are big deserts on the moon. Now the polar cap, which is just a tiny little patch right now, uh, about two months ago, that was much much larger, and it took up a much larger space. So this polar cap has been melting uh, over the last couple of months. And that's because of that, that side of the, the, the part of, the, of Mars is now pointed at the sun. And the sun is melting uh, that, those ices, uh, uh, water ice, but primarily uh, uh, carbon, monoxide, carbon dioxide. Um, and there is a polar cap on the other side as well. Uh, but that's facing away from us. We can't really see it. Uh, and it's probably uh, not much there anyway. 
Uh, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of what Mars looks like in a telescope. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop there, I think, and pass it back to you, Jim. Yeah, you can keep your sharing going right now. Um, I'm gonna talk just a little bit uh, more about Mars. As, oh, yeah. uh, as I mentioned earlier, Mars is about half the size of, of Earth. And uh, it is, um, it's day. So, you know, if, if you ever watched the, the movie Martian and they talk about it there, but their day, the Martian day, they call it a soul, is about 25, I think it's about 25 minutes longer than Earth's day. So it's just slightly longer. So that means uh, that Mars is rotating just slightly slower than, than Earth. Um, but the, the uh, year on Mars is uh, about 687 days. So it's uh, almost uh, twice that of what the Earth is. So we almost, we almost do two orbits for every one of Mars. And so when they launch spacecraft towards Mars, there's kind of a two-year window when they can launch them uh, once every two years when they can launch them so that uh, when they take off from Earth and they kind of arc around and get to uh, to Mars, that Mars is kind of catching up to it. So it just kind of flies into it like that. So um, once you're on Mars, you might be stuck there for a couple of years until you can come back into that window to return to Earth. All right, Bernie, you can stop sharing. Also, and just we're going to... A question for how, how about how long was that exposure in the camera that we were able to see Mars? Uh, right now I'm at uh, approximately four milliseconds. Anything past that would be too bright? Is that kind of your threshold? Yeah, uh, let me put the share back on again. You can kind of see it on the side there. Can you, is it back again? Yes. Okay, so if you look over on the left-hand side, here's my exposure setting. And here you can see where it's currently set, a, a little under four milliseconds. Um, so the, the uh, frame rate is quite high right now. Um, th the advantage of a high frame rate uh, and very, very fast exposure is that you're able to, to punch through, um, highly technical term there, punch through that, that atmospheric dispersion. If I went with a longer exposure time, uh, even if it didn't overexpose, it would tend to, the, the atmospheric dispersions would all add together and end up just smearing the image to the point where it would be just a big fuzzball. Uh -huh. Got to so, stay really low for the planets then. So the trick with, with planets uh, is, to, is to have a very, very short exposure time. Uh, I could go even shorter, uh, but I don't think we'd have, it, there's a diminishing returns uh, on the exposure time. And I think we're right about at the, at the, uh, the prime point. Yeah, like you were pointing out the Maria, probably, yeah, you start to lose that Maria detail if we're not quite exposing enough. Yeah, here, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up a little bit. You can see it just, it turns to, it turns to mud. And if I underexpose, uh, then there, there's basically nothing there. So there's a sweet spot that you've got to find, and it will vary not only with uh, cloud cover, <laughs> which we don't always have, but tonight we do. Uh, and uh, the altitude uh, where it is off of the horizon. Right now it's up at about, oh, 30 degrees. So it's getting up into the area of the sky where the clarity improves. Um, an hour from now, this image will be better, uh, but okay. um, you know we're working with the time that we have. Yes. Yeah, thank you. We don't want to turn Mars into mud, although there are a lot of geologists who would. All those phyllosilicates on Mars. Um, okay, thank you. You're welcome.
Okay. Um, so that, yeah, so that's Mars. And uh, it's kind of special because it is our uh, next door neighbor. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we are going to go over to Jupiter. Now, before I do that, I'm going to share my screen again and show you. You saw some stuff, a uh, planetarium program from uh, Flandreau earlier. And here is a program we like to use called Stellarium. It's a free program. You can download it if you want to. It's uh, stellarium.org and use it. And this just kind of is looking towards the south and it shows a nice lineup of the planets we're looking at tonight. So, so if you look on the left over here, this was Mars. Um, we'd like to be able to do Neptune, but I don't think we're gonna be able to, we'll probably show you what Neptune and Uranus off of our recording um, because uh, the clouds are just uh, making it a little bit difficult and Bernie was having, um, I think trouble getting a good alignment because Polaris is covered by clouds. So he couldn't zoom in or lock in on Polaris. Uh, so the moon is kind of in between uh, all those. And then you've got Saturn and Jupiter over here to the right. Saturn and Jupiter are hanging out in uh, Sagittarius. So you can kind of see uh, half horse, half person. Um, and what's easy to find when you're looking uh, towards the south, you've got good clear skies and some dark skies, is uh, you, can, you can find what's called the teapot, which is this right here. And if you look down here, you can kind of see the handle of the pot. This is the, right the basically the main part of the kettle. Find Jupiter. This is uh, uh, the top, and then this is the spout. And so uh, off the spout, if the steam were coming on, no, off the spout, then uh, that's where it's you're going. looking in towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop the sharing here, and Jim, you can go ahead and share your view of Jupiter. Hey, um, the reason that uh, you just got a smiling face instead of uh, live is that my software that, that works off my telescope uh, takes over the webcam. And so it's it won't let the webcam talk. So unfortunately, you get a picture that's about six years old taken up at the Grand Canyon Star Party. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do, I'm Jim O'Connor from Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. First thing I'd like to do is just show the equipment and then quick get over to Jupiter because the cloud is about to eat it right now. And in, in sunnier times, and I'll wait a bit for that picture to come popping out. And on the left is my work table with the laptop I'm staring at right now and the telescope in front of me, except it's pointed, oh, probably about 100 degrees away from that. It's that over my neighbor's house is where Jupiter is right now. And I've got a little monitor sitting there uh, uh, on a stand next to the telescope. That's how I can see better when I'm up at the scope trying to focus things and trying to uh, do alignments. Then I go back to the computer and, uh, and play with that when I have to do broadcast. Normally at school star parties, I don't take, I don't take a computer. I just use that uh, monitor on a stand. On the right is a closer view of the telescope. Bernie's got uh, uh, one size minus 10. Uh, I've got a 10 inch Schmidt Cassegrain and the camera I've got is the, also a Mallinckamp camera, uh, different technology. Mine CCD is with CMOS. They have the same identical mount, though, um, Celestron ABX. And there's, uh, to keep everyone from being scared to death, I got the edge of the camera not showing the six cables coming off of it. Bernie's got one because the way his CMOS works. I've got more snakes there than uh, sitting out there than a, a spaghetti restaurant. Anyway, um, I try not to trip at them in the dark. So that's the telescope I've got um, that we're gonna try to be uh, looking at right now. And let me go back to the planet I'm gonna try to talk about. And that will be if he's still there. Um, and it's barely, 
it's barely showing up and I've got it down about as bright as I can get. A cloud just rolled over as the last was finished. I'm trying to brighten the image. Wow, that's terrible. That's one sixtieth of a second. I may try to change view modes right now and get a little brighter. That's a little brighter. Jim, your um, screen still hasn't come across. It says it's started screen sharing, but I don't see the picture coming up. Uh-oh. There we go. Now we got it. You got it? Yeah, okay. No, you didn't get to see me. That was just a shadow. <laughs> that was just a thumbprint <laughs> on the screen while I was screwing around with it. Okay. There's Jupiter. And uh, the one kind of quirk about these kinds of cameras is you can spin them around 360 degrees so you never know what the orientation is of the planet you're looking at. You can see though the two strong south and north equatorial belts in there. The south equatorial belt, a little bit fatter, uh, is where the great red spot would appear. We lost the great red spot at about six o'clock. Um, the, uh, the bands are always of curiosity as to what are those things. And it appears to be those are weather patterns that are caused by the temperature difference. The core of Jupiter is about 30,000 degrees Fahrenheit because of gravity. The gravity is pulled it in, is pulling strong enough that the uh, gases that make up Jupiter have solidified. Even though they're, uh, they're what we would think of as gases, the pressure is so high the, even with the heat up to 30,000 Fahrenheit, they turned into a rocky, uh, uh, almost uh, solid center. So um, Jupiter is responsible for the structure of our solar system. Um, and um, because when it was formed, we learned with the exoplanets that we were, uh, uh, we had an unusual setup here. And the setup is that and since it's getting a little brighter, I might go back to video mode and see what I can get. A little better. What the, what's happening is space is cold, the core is hot, and it's sending um, uh, gases up from the bottom, uh, from the inner, and they're cooling off. And as they cool off, they turn dark and they plummet back down. And so if you... Um, if you look at them, the dark rings are heading back down. They cooled off. The bright rings are the ones that came up from there. But in the beginning, uh, it looks like with the simulations to match our exoplanet views, it looks like what happened was Jupiter was formed inside the orbit of Mercury. And so it was probably Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, the gas giants. But it was uh, quite a mating dance going on because of the gravitational effect. We are a late generation called a population one star. That means there, there was a lot of rocky debris in our gas cloud before the gases formed the stars. And so those all started hitting each other and forming little planets or planetesimals and getting bigger and bigger. Well, the effect of gravity of that was causing uh, the gas giants to form elliptical orbits. And as they were doing that, they were disrupting these uh, objects and they were slamming back into each other. The only original planet left from that, um, besides the gas giants, is Mars. Mars was far enough out they weren't hitting, but the simulations show you needed about 20 to 30 minor plant, small planets, but uh, moderately sized planets to be able to make Jupiter and uh, Saturn, Neptune and Uranus head out to where they are right now. So that was kind of an interesting, um, uh, an interesting dance. So um, Mercury, Venus, and Earth are second generation planets. There were other planets there that collided and reformed about four and three quarter billion years or so. It took about four and a half billion years ago for them to get into the, the current state that they are. Um, planets may also have been ejected, some of them thrown outside the orbit of uh, Neptune and some may have, uh, um, uh, some may have uh, stayed in the asteroid belt. Jupiter and Saturn are hurting the asteroid belt. They won't let planets form. 
so that what happens about, about, oh, about three billion years ago, three and a half billion years ago, is that they actually affected that asteroid belt so much, they slowed some of the asteroids down and they actually had what we call the late heavy bombardment when lots of rocks came in from the asteroid belt and further out due to the orbits of uh, the gravity of Jupiter and Saturn. And they pummeled the Earth, the Moon, and uh, uh, somewhat Mars and Mercury. Mercury lost about a third of its uh, a third of its size due to these things. So there was a lot of activity going on there, and I'm going to try to um, go back to upping the the cloud may have rolled in front of the, away from in front because now I'm starting to get a white ball. There it is. Right now, that's one sixtieth of a second. Um, let's uh, try to go up. I'm going to try to go up a little. faster. There's one one hundredth of a second coming up. So we're in the sweet spot between one sixtieth and one one hundredth, making it look good. So I'll go back to one sixtieth because what I want to do is the last thing I want to do is something uh, to move the planet. And I'm going to try to move the planet so that we can see its companions, the four what are called the Galilean moons. And I'm going to Remember when I said you put the cameras in, you don't know exactly what orientation you're in. And so you're rubbing your stomach and patting your head, trying to figure out which button moves that thing in the direction I want to go. And let's try this. And up. And you notice you don't see much in the way of moons yet. And that's because they're too dim compared to that. So what we're going to do is a trick with the uh, just like I did to get the bands. Now you're not going to see bands on there because what we're going to do is we're going to try to uh, extend the integration long enough that some of the planets might drop or some of the moons might drop out or drop in. And there's one you can see, uh, at least in the left side of my view. And there, there it is. And what I'm gonna try to do now is I'm gonna try to move it so that I can figure out which guy that is. No, that wasn't. I'm trying to find the moons. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the magnification a little bit. Right now we're at 480 power. And so that means it's a really tiny view. I'll just try a little trick now to drop that magnification down back to 320 power, which is the minimum I can go to right now. And shortly there, starting to see a few come in. A few of the dots you see, there it is. That's a moon coming into the, as I'm looking at it at about the 11 o'clock position, there's a moon. And so I might have to brighten this up a bit more to get that. And unlike Bernie's hey. wonderful piece of software, mine is I have to scroll all over. Hey, Jim, and when let you me get, get the, to the, uh, the moon uh, starting to show up, uh, go ahead and move your cursor and kind of circle them so that uh, that might help people see them easier. Yeah, I'll do that. And I also, like I think I said once, I've got the ability to actually mark them. So I can try that. Trouble is I'm getting up close to one second now. And that one second means it has to think a while before it throws every frame out. And and Bernie's got uh, Jupiter as well. So when you're done, we'll, we'll let them, everybody look at Jupiter through a different kind of configuration just so you can see it before we go over to Saturn. Yeah, because Bernie, Bernie's probably got uh, a whole lot less power than I've got. And I'm just trying to get them in a way that I can um, identify what they are. In fact, I'm going to leave that as the brightest and go um, do a trick up here. 
and say view it as a whole page, a little easier, a full screen. Okay, up to, up to the upper left, you see two white dots next to each other. The tiny dots are hot pixels right now. So don't pay any attention to stuff off to the right or to the left of a uh, di 45 degree di diagonal from upper left to lower right. Um, what you're seeing there are two moons that are real close to each other. And that's, um, uh, let me get the name, that's uh, Enceladus and Callisto. One of them has the longest orbit and one of them has a pretty short orbit. And the next one close in is Io. And the thing that's interesting about, and let me try to, I promised you my point and I didn't. So, let me go back to the, uh, oh, yeah, try to do some painting on there. And now get my pointer, this object right here, is Enceladus. That moon is cold and probably has a frozen surface. And it's, uh, it's pretty close to water. And it's got about six miles of wet water underneath that icy layer. The, and it sprays water volcanoes. This object right here, To get to them. Um, Want to get the right. Uh... Okay. Um, Enceladus is cold, so you get water volcanoes because of as it orbits, it orbits elliptically. And that causes what are called tidal stresses. It flexes and it gets warm enough to actually raise the uh, pressure of the liquid water under the ice and it actually sprays through the ice. Down below that is the hot volcanoes. In fact, that's about the most volcanic object in the solar system. And that, um, the, and that was Isle. And so we've got three of the four moons there. I'll go Callisto right here. There's Callisto, and then I'm going to have to move this to get Ganymede, if I can move them. Ganymede is off the map right now. I may actually have to take Jupiter off. Nope, he's going the wrong direction, wrong direction, wrong direction. This hey, way. Jim. You've been, yeah. you've been saying Enceladus, but don't you mean Europa? Yeah, because Enceladus <laughs> is on our other planet. Yeah, <laughs> just wanted to correct you there. Enceladus. I'm sorry, I only put the, the E down and I was doing a lot of Saturn work last night. And that's your, And there it is, that's Ganymede down there that's coming in at the bottom. And let me clear the screen and uh, go boop. And there is Ganymede, pretty big moon. I believe that's a, maybe either the biggest or the second biggest in the solar system. So anyway, those are the interesting things that are around with Jupiter. Um, I'm gonna try to, uh, uh, let's see if there's anything else I got that might be amusing to relay. Um, that's about all I can force this system to do. I'm gonna go back to the uh, not so bright, clear this. No, Jim, if you want to, and if you want to wrap up. And now we uh, got his stripes back. 
then uh, we can turn it over to Bernie I'm, for another I'm look. Done with what I've got. Sure. Okay, great. And yeah, so that was I'm good... virtually done, and so is uh, the slide in front of my Jupiter. All right, so you can stop. Bernie and I are about 45 and... miles apart, so we should have better parallels. Yeah. You can stop sharing and Bernie, you can go ahead and share your scope stop and sure. uh, talk a little bit about uh, what you're seeing and then we'll go over to Rick and Saturn. Okay, I've uh, switched over from Mars to, uh, to Jupiter. So I thought I'd give you a a slightly different view uh, of Jupiter through the clouds, unfortunately, uh, but the, it's coming and going. Uh, so you can see the the uh, the polar belts quite easily. Uh, they they always stand out very well. Uh, there's a uh, a festoon on the lower polar belt here, uh, you can just make it out. That's a, a cyclone, similar to the Great Red Spot, but nowhere near as large. Uh, but there's a cyclone there and it has kind of a bluish tint to it. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Oh, things are getting brighter, the, the clouds moving out of the way. Bear with me here. This cloud uh, is, uh, uh, has various thicknesses to it. So I'm trying to keep up with the cloud. Now it's coming back again. Anyway, I thought I'd give you a different view of, uh, of Saturn, uh, of Jupiter. And uh, let's see if we can catch those moons. I'm gonna go way up and like Jim did in um, uh, exposure here. So this is five seconds. And uh, what do we got here? We've got Ganymede, uh, Io, uh, Io. Uh, this should be Europa and this should be Callisto. So those are the four major moons uh, of Jupiter kind of all in a row. Thought you'd like a, a different view of it. Yeah, that's cool. All right, well, thanks, uh, Bernie. Uh, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch over to Saturn. So assuming it's not behind a, a cloud, Rick, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen anytime. While, while you're doing that, I'm going to just yep. uh, mention that uh, Saturn, so Saturn's our second largest planet in the solar system. Jupiter's the first, the largest. And it's got, you can put, 1300 Earths inside the sphere of Jupiter. Saturn is about twice as far away as Jupiter and about half the size or a lot smaller anyway. You can put about 700 Earths inside of Saturn. Um, Saturn actually has more moons than Jupiter. Saturn is now up to 82, um, where Jupiter has 79. And generally we can see four or five of Saturn's moons, just it depends a little bit on how they're lined up. All right, Rick, go ahead and uh, take it from here and uh, you can kind of explain what we're looking at. Yeah, so you're looking at Saturn right there. Um, it's not very big in my telescope. Uh, my telescope is more of a wide angle telescope than Bernie or Jim's. Um, but one reason I wanted to show you Saturn tonight to my telescope is Saturn was first observed um, is something more than a point of light in the sky by Galileo um, back around the year 1610. Um, he didn't invent the telescope, but he was the first person to make one and actually use it to look up at the sky at night. And so his telescope was of a similar design than mine, a little cruder. Um, and what he saw that night, the first time he looked at it was not too much different than what you're seeing here. Maybe not quite as clear, but uh, he saw a small oblong object. And what he saw as the rings is, he thought those were ears or possibly other small bodies around it. 
he he didn't recognize them for rings at the time. Now, right now, Saturn is um, tilted um, with its axis, um, its southern axis pointed toward us. So the upper part of the rings is pointed towards us and the lower part of the rings is actually circling uh, behind the planet now, they're blocked behind them. And now, just like Jim showed you the, uh, the moons of Jupiter, I can show you the, the moons of Saturn in a similar manner. If I crank up the uh, gain here, you'll start to see little dots of light appear. So let me get my little map out here. So what you're seeing, you'll see a dot there on the right side, two dots on the left side. The two dots on the left side are, um, 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 Dion is down there on the bottom, Ray is up here, over here is Enceladus, way out here is, is uh, Tethius, and way out over here is um, Hyperion. So those are its brightest moons. Um, generally, it takes a very powerful telescope to be able to see those, uh, even through a telescope, because they're a lot further away than Jupiter's, so they're a lot harder to see. But through photography here, we can um, crank it up and we can see them. So again, coming back down here, so we can see Saturn a little bit better. Now, again, my telescope can't magnify this nearly as much as Jim or Bernie's could. And that's, I've now, you know, magnified it beyond the, uh, actually zoomed in beyond the capabilities of the, of the sensor. You're also seeing it in black and white because my astrophotography camera is actually uh, a black and white camera, uh, very similar to what's on board the Hubble Space Telescope. It actually also has a black and white camera. It achieves color by putting filters in front of that camera um, and then combining those images later. That's the same way I get my color images. But uh, with that, um, uh, Jim or Jim, would you like to add any uh, Saturn lore here that I haven't covered? Um, no, I think uh, I think you pretty well uh, covered it all. It's uh, it's a fascinating. Uh, I mean, I I never get tired of looking at Saturn or Jupiter through a telescope. No, uh, they just uh, you know, and 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 visually, actually, if you've got a good aligned telescope, visually they can look even more appealing than cameras because cameras can accentuate the the seeing issues and the atmosphere and stuff like that, where visually it, it's not quite so bad. So the one thing I'd like to throw in is the fact that the rings being so bright, yet they're only a kilometer thick, and that they're, they're very icy, and uh, they reflect a lot of sunlight back at us, which is why we can see it. But to be only one kilometer thick and still us to see it as far away as twice as far away as Jupiter is, is just incredible. I will also add that if you want to see the best pictures of Saturn, um, it's now um, deceased, but we had for many years the Cassini probe uh, orbiting Saturn, which took spectacular images. And the way that Cassini ended its mission is they actually tilted its orbit so that it went up around the poles and then dove between the planet and the rings and took pictures while it did that. And the first time they did it, they didn't know if it sur would survive. They thought it might hit some dust or particles going through, but it actually survived. And so they looped it back up around and they did it again. And they got some very good data on the rings and Saturn when they did that. Um, so if you go, the, the Cassini website is still out there, the NASA Cassini site, they're still processing, they'll be processing data from that mission for, for decades to come. But uh, you can go out and see some spectacular images of, of Cassini. And then on Jupiter, uh, we have the Juno probe. It looks like a cloud's coming over. Yeah, it already wiped me out. Yeah, a cloud's coming over. Um, right now, there is a similar probe orbiting Jupiter that's still active right now called the Juno probe. 
and Juno is capturing just absolutely spectacular images of Jupiter. They, they look like works of art. It's just unbelievable the pictures they're getting from, 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 from the Juno probe. Well, from the scientific right. point of view on the, on the rings, it's always been a curiosity as to how they've lasted that long and haven't plummeted into Saturn because Saturn, Saturn's got a lot of gravity too. If you, uh, its center, its core temperature is about 20,000 Fahrenheit. When you, and with Jupiter 30,000 Fahrenheit, the surface of our sun is, t is 10,000 Fahrenheit. And so of course it's 30 million Fahrenheit down near the core of the sun, but that they're two and three times as hot as the surface of the sun in the core. But out at the surface, they're closer to negative 150 to 200 degrees. So the fascinating thing about the rings is that they stayed there and it looks like all those moons that are going around there, a lot of them, several of them act as shepherding moons and they're keeping those ice particles from plummeting back into Saturn. So that's another fascinating point about having as many moons as Saturn does. Yeah, so um, Allison, how are we doing on time? Uh, you know, we can, Bernie's got a view of Saturn. We could do that if you wanted to. Um, we can play the recording on Neptune and Uranus, or we can uh, answer any questions and, and go from there. Yeah, we're doing okay on time. Um, we kind of kept it open, you know, ending somewhere between 8.30 and 9. So we've definitely, you know, we've got, um, you guys have time. Um, I know the clouds are a little more uh, the trick here. Um, but a few follow-up items and then one question to, to Jupiter and Saturn here. I like that Rick mentioned that these images of Jupiter from the Juno mission that's currently orbiting Jupiter are like works of art. And in fact, they really are. We've had both last year and this year, artists submit images of Jupiter from the Juno mission, um, whether they repainted it or reworked the Jupiter images. So they really, really are works of art. Um, they've been in our art show. And the other really neat side of the Juno mission for the public is that all of us, anyone can request the pointing or the imaging of the camera, there's a public camera called JunoCam. And JunoCam is this really neat interactive camera that allows the public to say, no, this is where we want to look on Jupiter. So if anyone is into that, um, JunoCam and the Juno and on the main website, you can go check that out and you could submit where you want to look on Jupiter. And um, they put it into the sequence whenever that's in the favorable orbit. So it's Kind of a cool public outreach um, object as well. And then a question about the moons. I know you mentioned, Jim, that 82 current moons around Saturn. Where do you get your best update for that? Does Stellarium program have that for you? Because this number changes, fluctuate. It does. Yeah, it does. Um, and usually the best place to get it is the NASA website. Um, they have a solar system portion there and uh, they do a pretty good job of updating it. Uh, but it was uh, probably well, maybe a year, year and a half ago that uh, they kind of adjusted all the moons because Saturn was down, I think around 59 or 60 or something like that. And Jupiter had more. And then all of a sudden Jupiter went up 10 and Saturn went up even more and, and ended up uh, above uh, Jupiter. So yeah, it kind of fluctuates. You know, the, the strange thing with, with the gas giants, especially Jupiter and Saturn, is that anything that flies close to it either crashes into it or becomes a moon. So they're always changing. Um, Jupiter's kind of our, our big brother because it can actually pull in some of the wayward asteroids that might have made it all the way into the inner solar system. and we certainly don't want them hitting Earth. So that's a good thing. Sometimes the, the uh, gravity of Jupiter will fling them out. Uh, you know, if you remember uh, quite a few years ago, uh, the comet Sh um, shoemaker Levy 9 that crashed into Jupiter was a comet that got too close to Jupiter's gravity. It was actually on a prior pass, I think it was, and it actually broke it apart. And then the next time it came around, the gravity pulled it in. So. Um, it's pretty uh, 
it's pretty amazing. They're, they're actually good out there. Um, Jupiter's just on the other side of the asteroid belt from the inner planet. So if you go, um, you know, Mercury, Venus, and Earth, then Mars, and then in between Mars and Jupiter is the asteroid belt. So Jupiter can kind of help stabilize those asteroids out there and, and, and so that they don't get perturbed as easily and get thrown into the inner solar system, which can be very bad for us. Yes, I like to say there's only two masses that matter in the solar system, the sun and Jupiter. Everything else <laughs> plays their game. Okay, yeah, well, uh, if you wanna play the video or if you think, I know the Uranus and Neptune are really already hard to observe, well, without clouds since they're far and faint. Um, uh, yeah, why don't we, uh, why don't we, cause they're kind of similar. So let's do the video on, I think the one I've got queued up right now is Neptune. So let's do, it's about 10 minutes and it's from our star party we did uh, a couple weeks ago. And then after that, we'll just kind of wrap things up. Uh, I'll let you know where, where our virtual star parties are hosted and things like that in case anybody wants to. Hey, Jim. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to say while you're queuing it up, um, we had talked about Mars and the, uh, the names of the moon, Deimos and Phobos. And sometimes I like to explain where that came from because that was from the Greek. Greeks, the Greek name for uh, Mars was Eris, A-R-E-S. And in 1929, the, there, was so, there was a lot of naming confusion among astronomer, uh, astronomy and astronomers and different cultures. So the International Astronomical Union said the planets would hold their uh, Roman names. Um, well, Eris then got lost, the Greek name. But Eris, in the Greek, as the Greek god of war, had two sons. Deimos and Phobos, and that was Greek for dread and fear, and, which is appropriate for a god of war. So we kept the, we changed the name to the Roman name for the, for the planet, but we kept the Greek name for the two moons once the moons were discovered. Uh, the moons weren't discovered until about 1877. Cool, okay. All right, if you, uh, you and Bernie want to mute your mic, uh, I'm going to uh, play the, the last, uh, our party we did we'll just do it on uh, Neptune and uh, so you'll hear us talking it'll go about 10 minutes then I'll stop it and uh, we'll go from there we're going to look at uh, some large not as big as Jupiter and Saturn were they're a whole lot further away Neptune is uh, just about as far away as Pluto is right now it is, um, let's see, it is 2.7 billion miles away. So if you remember, Pluto was about 3.16. So it's, uh, it's almost as far as Pluto is. Um, Neptune is the last classic or regular planet. Um, Pluto gets into the dwarf planet. And then probably, you know, sometime in the near future, I would be willing to bet we're going to find other large objects out in the Kuiper Belt and maybe even the Oort Cloud once we get some of these more powerful telescopes up. Um, it's, so Neptune is slightly smaller than Uranus, which we'll look at here in just a minute. And, uh, and, and it's uh, about four times the size of the Earth. So you can put inside of Neptune, you can put about 60 Earths inside the ball of Neptune. And when we look at it on Jim's scope, you'll see a little bit of color to it. And when you look at it visually, if you've got probably at least a seven or eight inch telescope or bigger, you can actually pick up a little bluish color when you're looking at um, Neptune. It is uh, one of the, it's the windiest planet in our solar system. The winds average about 1200 miles per hour. So that's fast. Um, it's got a very short day. It orbits in about 16 hours and it's got 14 moons. So most of those are probably captured Kuiper belt objects or things like that that have drifted too close to, uh, to Neptune. And, and actually, and I didn't mention this earlier, but actually all the four large planets um, have rings as well. The only one we can see through most telescopes is Saturn, but through some of the professional telescopes and certainly in, in the professional cameras, you can actually see the faint rings around Neptune and Uranus and uh, Jupiter as well. 
Um, the blue color kind of comes from, from the methane that's in the atmosphere. So that's why it looks blue to us. Uh, it is not visible to the uh, naked eye. It, uh, it's about, it takes, it's got a very long year orbit. So um, it takes about 165 years to go once around the sun. So it does not move very fast. That is, like I said, that is the furthest planet from a uh, regular planet from our sun. So now what we're gonna do is Jim's going to show us what it looks like in his telescope. Now remember, he's got a, a 10 inch telescope. So it's a pretty good sized amateur telescope. Now there are much bigger ones, but there's also much smaller ones. The bigger the telescope, the more light it can gather. Um, I didn't really show you here, but Neptune is kind of hanging up, hanging out in Aquarius, which is the water bearer. You can see him holding a jar and splashing water down. So Neptune's uh, very close, kind of in between Aquarius and Pisces. All right, uh, in the center of the screen is, uh, is a dim blue object and it will start flickering a little bit and it's a function of the electronics that it, uh, some of the flicker happens uh, separate from other parts of the little object, but it actually is a tiny blue ball from where we are. Jim was talking about, about uh, we have been talking about these gas giants as, as being called ice giants. At the core of the gas uh, giants, because of the intensity of the gravity of their size, the pressure is so high that even though the temperature is hot, it still forms uh, a form of ice. It's actually a metallic form of the gas. So they're very icy. And the other part, uh, the other uh, interesting thing is their outer surfaces are uh, colder than 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, uh, minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that makes it a very cold place also. And although we know Neptune can fit a lot of Earths in it, so it's a big object and has, has somewhat a lot of gravity, if you were at the center, if you stood on, if you had found a way to stand on the outer surface of Neptune, you would only feel 1.1 times the Earth's gravity. So that's the only one of those big giants you could actually stand on if you found a way to uh, to survive uh, falling through the gas. So this is a very unusual planet. Um, Neptune uh, was always said to have been discovered in 1846, but really Galileo discovered it. He just didn't realize it. And it was having a conjunction with Jupiter at the time, it was real close to Jupiter. And he just identified it as a field star. It wasn't until around 1821 when um, a mathematician was trying to plot the orbit of Uranus. And they found out that the orbital plot didn't match uh, Newton's laws of physics, that they said something else bigger is out there. And some of them remembered Galileo had seen something uh, back when uh, he, he was looking through his telescope 200 years earlier. So they started looking, but they knew by the deformation of Neptune's orbit about where it should be. And when they looked up there uh, and looked in the right spots, they found it. Uh, two uh, astronomers, Gaia and uh, Lavernier, they predicted where it would be and they found it where they predicted it, right in Capricorn. Near the, near the boundary between Capricorn and Eris, they found it in 1846. In 1821, the mathematical solution for where it should be was uh, published by a cartographer, but nobody paid any attention to him. There was gonna be another object out there. It wasn't until 1846 that they found it where they predicted it would be. So that one uh, was the last of the major planets that was found and the only one whose position was predicted before it was found. Neptune is the furthest planet from the sun. And uh, Neptune is uh, a, a star-like object. It's very faint. Uh, usually it's very difficult to pull up on a telescope, mainly because it's so small that it doesn't show much of a disk. And if you look on the screen, dead center, you'll notice there's 
what appears to be just a bright star, that's the planet Neptune. And uh, it has a very small disk in comparison to the stars around it. Now, these are stars that are in the same field as the planet. Now, you'll notice right above the planet, there's a small little point of light. That is Neptune's moon, Triton. Triton is one of the largest moons in the solar system. Uh, and it's very, very, very cold because it's so far away. Uh, Triton was the last object to be looked at and photographed by the Voyager 2 spacecraft way back in 1989. Uh, I was alive back then and I was glued to the TV watching the images come in. Uh, Triton turned out to be quite a surprise because what they thought would be a cold, dead, uninteresting uh, moon turned out to have quite a few surprises to it. Amongst other things, it had nitrogen geysers that were exploding nitrogen out, out into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, off, the plant, uh, off the moon's surface. So uh, Triton was quite a surprise uh, when they uh, flew by it. And that was many, many years ago. So now I've reduced the exposure time down. You can't see the Triton any longer, but you can see the blue of the planet itself. Uh, and that is due to all the methane in the atmosphere of Neptune. All right, so that was uh, just kind of a 10 minute shot from our last star party we did. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there. What I am gonna do is uh, gonna show you a couple of slides that uh, in case you're interested in the equipment that we used and things like that. So uh, here's just a, another shot of, uh, so Jim has, uh, Jim O'Connor has a uh, 10 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. And, uh, and a Malincam exterminator. And then Bernie's using an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain with a Malincam DS10C, TEC. Um, so uh, different kinds of cameras on different, uh, different kinds of telescopes. And then Rick uh, is using a four inch uh, refractor on a, on a, a Los Mundi um, G11 mount and a, a monochrome cool camera. As I mentioned earlier, the program that we were using for the planetarium was Stellarium. And you can get that at stellarium.org. Uh, let's see, do that. Um, so what we have coming up uh, for TAAA, we've been doing quite a few virtual star parties, but we do have another one December 5th. We're gonna attempt to do it live rather than uh, looking at uh, you know recording in advance. So we we'll hope the weather will uh, cooperate with us. But you can find our virtual star parties. We'll stream them live on our Facebook page. Just go to Facebook and, and search Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. Uh, you don't have to, it's a public site, so you don't have to have a Facebook account to be able to view them there. And then after the fact, uh, um, then I usually upload them to our YouTube channel, and I'll show you where those are here in just a second. And if you're in the Tucson area, we're going to try to start getting into, you know, some in-person events. We've got two uh, scheduled in January with Pima County uh, Parks and Rec, but my guess is those will probably cancel. Uh, and then we're going to we're going to continue doing virtual star parties um, after the first year, probably quarterly. So we're going to do another one in, in February 12th um, at seven o'clock Arizona time. So again, just kind of I'll, I try to create Facebook events on this. You can get updates and, and things like that. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, if uh, I was going to turn it back over to uh, Allison for any final questions or anything, and we'll go from there. Yes, thank you, Jim, and all of TAAA, as always. Um, we will also be um, making this into shorter video, or, well, tonight was a shorter night, but 
the big event weekend, um, we had TAAA for solar observing. So you can go back and watch their solar observing. We'll repost this video tonight. Um, thank you all for joining us. I want to end it with a fun little NASA video. I'm glad that uh, Rick actually mentioned Hubble Space Telescope. So I'm going to play this video from NASA Goddard that's a little bit of the spooky themed. Um, and then I'll come back on and say the official goodbye. But thank you to all of TAAA as, as, as always uh, throughout the years, giving us that telescope experience, even not uh, with our eyepieces, um, with our eyes up to the eyepiece rather. But yeah, just a quick uh, two minute video here, fun little NASA video, then I'll come on and say goodbye and uh, we'll go from there. In 2008, Hubble astronomers announced the discovery of a new exoplanet, one orbiting the nearby star Fomalhaut. Dubbed Fomalhaut b, the new world orbited inside a ring of dusty debris and was claimed as the first exoplanet directly observed in visible light. Recently, several teams of astronomers have questioned that Fomalhaut b is a planet at all. The most damaging study in early 2012 was the failure to detect the young planet's heat. Fomalhaut B was gone. Now it's back. A new analysis of 2004 and 2006 images taken by Hubble brings Fomalhaut B back to planetary status and suggests that it may be a rare type of exoplanet. The object seems to be moving at the right speed and direction to explain the ring's properties, including its position offset from the star. A dust cloud wouldn't survive very long on its own unless it was anchored to a planet. And the failure to detect Fomalhaut B in the infrared merely indicates that the planet is smaller than originally thought, less than twice Jupiter's mass. Another team used Hubble to observe the system again this year and those results are expected to be published soon. So keep your children close. Fomalhaut B, the zombie planet, roams around its host star once more. Okay, just a fun little bit. I've uh, known about that video for a while and never had a spooky night to play it on. So um, thanks for uh, joining us for, for all of the components of tonight uh, with Flandro and TAAA and reviewing our uh, winners. So make sure you go check out the website, the 2020 art page. Again, it's gonna be up until October 31st. We've got another week left of the art. We have had a uh, really phenomenal year and uh, you know the silver linings and, and kind of a different virtual way but we hope to continue our virtual odyssey and hopefully we'll see some of you all next week for our musical closeout on Friday night and until then Godspeed thank you all take care <laughs>